Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to Talking Drupal. This is episode 73, November 12th, 2014. This is the 12th, I think. And we're talking today about MailChimp and things we've done with MailChimp. So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We have Jason, John, and Nick, as usual. Uh, well, not as usual lately, but... Um, What's more? Getting back to usual. Getting back to usual. That's a better way to put it. Thanks, Jason. And we have Jason Pomental from uh, HW Design. What's up, Jason? Um, pretty, uh, pretty excited about, about how uh, stuff has been shaping up, actually, with part of what we're talking about today. Um, As as one of the things that we've been working on is is their email campaigns um, and how those work and and we've been working on a, an integration with Mailchimp that's coming along really well. So we're pretty you know, excited about it. You know, communicating with with customers and and people that customers interact with is so important, and email is such a critical part of that. It that is. Of, oftentimes, we sort of with social media and a little bit we've. A little forgotten about email. Yeah, we so have, and I, yeah, you know, we've seen that actually just organizing um, the Drupal PVD meetup. If if we don't have emails go out to people, it doesn't matter how much we tweet, how much we use platforms like Meetup. If it's not in their inbox, they miss it. They just forget. Yeah, email email is a direct connection with people. Yeah, it's a really important thing not to forget. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I email, mean, email's great. Um, we actually just did. Um, my first responsive email with web fonts yesterday. Actually, it came out really well, and it looks awesome. Mm, good. Interesting to hear about that because email has been one of those places that has struggled with uh, even yeah. HTML. I mean, we've been doing email campaigns for years, and when we do email campaigns, we're still doing table structures in HTML, and um, it's it's interesting how far behind HTML emails are with the rest of the web. Yeah, it's it's pretty awful, and yeah. you know it's far from perfect. It's more deciding what is the level of okay, yeah. and and that's really what it comes down to. And, and we've tackled a lot of that stuff with what we've been working on for for Yale, which has been really really pretty cool. And you know what? Perfect doesn't need to be what it needs. To you don't need perfect in email. You just need a way to communicate and have it look reasonable. And and it's a way to just touch people and, and get them to interact with you. So we're not talking about building web pages that look perfect in in email. So Yeah, you have you have to kind of dial back your expectations and, exactly. and and keep what you're putting in there simple enough that you know it will just work. And if you keep yourself grounded by saying, hey, what does my text email look like? Because you need to create those two. Like, what is a text version of this? Uh, then uh, it helps you stay a little bit grounded in what the HTML version may look like. <laughs> right. Very true. So we also have John Picozzi from Oomph. Welcome, John. Good afternoon, Internet. <clears throat> I see you're at home again today. So I welcome am, back to I your am home. at home. Home sweet home. Um, I am looking forward to uh, to hearing uh, Jason's experiences with his responsive and uh, type laden email. Um, simply because we've been doing a lot of email work for a client of ours lately, and it's there's a lot of testing that goes into it, and it's you know it's very much as you guys were saying. Uh, you kind of have to go back to coding coding emails in the in the 90s a little bit. And, and remember some of those roots in order to get things to look right in every single mail client. So yeah. it'll be interesting to hear what Jason has to say and his experiences of, of Esley. And, and the other thing we're going to touch on today, too, is also volume emails and mm. some tools you can use to just send out thousands of emails. How, how do you handle that today? And, and what tools are we using to do that? Which brings me to Nick Laughlin. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Yeah, I'm how, looking for. How are things at Enlightened Design these days? Yeah, things are getting better. Looking up. <laughs> I was really hoping you'd say enlightening, but <laughs> <laughs> there's only so many times we can use that joke. So now you just knocked another one off. 
Yep. I uh, I mean, I've used both Mailchimp and and uh, Constant Contact, and I've been looking at the new Mail Campaign Monitor or Mail Campaign. I don't recall the name of the company. Campaign Monitor. Campaign Monitor. Um, so I'm I'm interested to hear some of the customizations that you guys have, uh, or or some of the reasons why you've chosen Mailchimp versus the other two. Um, and then of course the volume mailing that Stephen was talking about with Mandro. Nick, I can't. Uh, for those that are watching on the video, I can't help but ask, what is that project that's going on behind you, with all of those paint and colors? I can see that happening. What's happening over there? Uh, so it's a nativity that my wife bought that she's painting. It's got all the little. It's like a precious moments. Ah, oh, okay. So. Precious Moments Albino right there. Yeah, so, so Nick, so for those who are listening through the audio, Nick is in his office and in back of him is a desk that looks like there's a major art project going on with lots of colors and some figurines and stuff. So, Wow, good. So your office is your work office and your play office at the same time. Uh, it's not my project. It's my wife's. But, uh, <laughs> her, her desk adjoins mine, so... Yeah, so let's, she, let's be clear about that, right? <laughs> much like much like the rest of us, it's it's my office is her office. Right. I understand. All right, so let, let's get into the topic today. Um, and, we, and we titled the show Mailchimp uh, be, just because it's a tool that we're using. All of us are using at some level with Drupal, and it seemed like a great way to to, to talk it. Um, I'm not sure any of us are Mailchimp experts. Would any, is anyone a Mailchimp expert here? Well, I'm certainly a lot more familiar with it now. Okay. All right. I wouldn't want to say I'm an expert, but get, you know. Okay, oh. so officially, Jason is our Mailchimp expert today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's get started. So, what? Uh, you know, actually, we have we have a topic to talk about before we do this, though. In, in our show notes, which is net neutrality. There's been some uh, news uh, on the interwebs in the last few days regarding net neutrality. So um, what's happened in the last couple of days? So um, in the last couple of days, President Obama released a statement. Uh, the gist of the statement was that he's urging the FCC to classify internet connections as a utility. Um, classifying internet as a utility uh, grants all sorts of protections. Um, it's a, it becomes a basic right. Uh, you can't discriminate usage or connections. It's like electricity or water. You know, a company like National Grid or another utility company can't just shut off your water just because they don't like your... Um, your political leanings are using too much. It, you know, as long as you're paying your bill, um, you have right to water. So this is, you know, it's pretty big because it's the first time the president's come out in favor of marking as utility. Um, I think it's still a long way to go. You know, it's it's interesting that um, I mean, there's been a lot of pressure from many large websites and many people. Um, urging net neutrality and there's been it's been a hot topic for the last probably year and a half um, so well, that, it, it, oh, go ahead. well I think one um, I, I think it's it's a on the surface level I think it's it's kind of one of those things you feel like is really obvious but I think what uh, what's underneath it and and what kind of motivated some of the um, pressure to need something like net neutrality were some issues surrounding bandwidth use by services like Netflix. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the percentage of internet traffic that is Netflix has gone through the roof. And it, at times, can be a significant percentage of all net traffic in the U.S. Um, and, and elsewhere. It's growing. But, um, so, it, you know, it used to be that 40% of the traffic on the internet was actually spam email. And that actually is starting to be supplanted by video streaming services like YouTube and, um, and Netflix. And the issue was that the companies that own the pipes into your home 
the ones that are you know like the the Cox cables, the Comcasts, the um, the the other platforms that that own the connection into your home were um, seeing disproportionate amounts of that bandwidth used up by these services, and and they wanted to not um, they wanted to not have that happen for free. Um, so you know people are buying up these these services and higher speed access based on um, based on having uh, a level of traffic that they didn't expect to get that big and so they price things accordingly and you know so we have a, a package from Cox Cable that costs us you know some number of dollars per month and we're supposed to get 50 megabytes um, per second download speed but they price all these things based on the premise that you're rarely going to actually use it and the problem is people are actually using it so they're streaming all this HD quality video all the time and the networks are overloaded so they want to get companies like Netflix to pay more they want to basically have them pay money to deliver their content as fast as you would get content from some other service the interesting thing about that as well, Jason, is a lot of these companies, and I'm not going to single out any any one particular company, but um, a lot of these companies aren't actually giving you the the bandwidth that they uh, purport to be giving you. Um, you know, they'll you'll do bandwidth tests, and you know, if you if you call your your cable provider, they'll say, oh, go to, you know, internetspeedtest.com or whatever it is, and um, that website's actually um, subsidized by um, by the cable companies, so it factors in uh, it factors in the, um, you know, the the actual speed that they're giving you and, and the, what they say they're supposed to be giving you and, and buffers it in some way to make it make it look like you're getting what you're supposed to. So I think that's another issue is that like the speed at which you can upload and download stuff. Um, you know, definitely shouldn't be throttled, but you should also be able to get exactly what you pay for. Yeah, I mean, it, what it, it boils down to is companies are looking to triple charge for the data. I mean, they're looking to, um, you, you pay, you know, Comcast, Cox, Charter, whatever, for your connection, and then you're paying, you know, Netflix or some other service, Amazon Prime, for the the data, and then Comcast is turning around and charging Netflix extra just to be able to deliver the content. And so net neutrality is about saying data is data. It doesn't matter where it's coming from or who it's coming from. As long as you've paid for a connection, it needs to be treated equally. And that will prevent things like, for example, um, if one company stops, uh, isn't on good terms with another company, preventing you know, fast speed. So, for example, slowing down Wikipedia or slowing down Google in favor of their own search engine. Um, yeah, the car the cartoon that was sort of getting passed around um, from the oatmeal uh, that I just shared on Google Plus earlier. We'll we'll include a link to that. Actually, explains it pretty well. And there was a real scenario there. Um, you know, the like what Nick's suggesting is you know Comcast could come up with their own search engine and let you access that one for free. And slow down your access to Google, and try and to try and steer you towards their own platform. Um, what they actually did in reality during negotiations at one point um, to try and get Netflix to pay them money to contribute to covering this cost of, of all this bandwidth usage was to, they actually throttled end users' access to Netflix and slowed down that service to the point where it was almost unusable for many subscribers which added a ton of pressure to Netflix and they ended up pointing up and paying Comcast a ton of money and so that's the kind of thing that needs to be made illegal because yeah. they're really allowed to extort anyone they want based on who's using traffic at that time yeah. exactly and, and one it's a very fine it's a very fine line um, you know I'm, I'm all for not not throttling the internet or not not limiting the amount of bandwidth or or data based on who you're connecting to but to what Nick was saying earlier on in the show considering you know considering the internet a utility that people can't live without like electricity and water is it, it's a tough sell it's a tough sell for me and I you know I, I quote unquote <laughs> build the internet well um, uh, I'm, I, I I have a I, I disagree with that quite strongly. Um, 
Well, because, well, because you, I mean, you make your living well, off of it. Yeah, but also, John, just in its simplest terms, I think classifying it as utility, uh, access to television is governed as utility, and and so increasingly, if the way that you get the content that you would normally get over the television through some other means like Hulu Plus or Netflix, why shouldn't that be governed in exactly the same way? Um, I, I don't have a I don't have a great answer for that. I'm I just, you know I I'm not you know, sure that I do either. Uh, but I'm I'm just the point I'm, is you can also live without TV. You know, that's you know. that's that's true. But increasingly you'll find that even getting a basic education is tied to getting content online. So... I want to ask you a question here. So, I mean, go ahead, Steve. Sorry. So I'm not going to uh, pretend to understand all of these issues with net neutrality. It is my understanding, though, that if I get Netflix through my Apple TV, which I have, versus just streaming it online, I get better performance through my Apple TV. That for, is, that based on based on contracts and negotiations that have happened outside of what my relationship is with my cable company. That that is true, and I think the reasoning for that is that your Netflix your net the Netflix you're getting through your Apple TV isn't actually coming from Netflix; it's coming from Apple, and the internet providers are harping on Netflix specifically. So. The fact well, that so con- Apple has created a relationship with with Netflix that brings their content down to Apple and it can deliver it to me better than I can get from another place. I and I think that that kind is of that highlights- related to is that related to this issue? I'm not even sure. I, it's just a matter. I think it's, it's a matter of time before your before your internet service provider goes, oh hey Apple, you're you're obfuscating our our system here. We're gonna we're gonna start throttling you as well. And I, I think ultimately, that this- ultimately I think what we're what we're getting to and what we think is bad is the fact that your internet service provider shouldn't have the ability to throttle your connection based on the type of content that you're getting or based on um, the type of websites that you're visiting. It, they should be um, completely agnostic of one another. Yeah, and the, there's two very quick points that I want to make that relate to this. One is it's, it's incredibly insidious because when Comcast slows down Netflix's connection, the end user doesn't see the, that it's Comcast doing it. They just think Netflix service now no longer works and is slow and will cancel Netflix. The second thing is, if you put this in a different context, you can you can possibly see the abuse that can come from this. So forget about Netflix, because ultimately Netflix really isn't, isn't the end of the world. But right. if you bring it into the context of like you know high volume trading, if one company, for example, can pay for a, a, a five milliseconds less latency than another one, then that company will make hundreds of millions of dollars every month more than their competitors. So then you can you, you can start changing things, and you can take it even further. News, so you can start injecting different news and spinning. You know, then political. Um, if you're in a you know highly democratic or a highly republican. Right. Um, neighborhood, then you'll start getting ads injected into websites that you're going to without permission of either you or the website provider. Right. I, I think, yeah, I, and I mean, I know that we can't stay on this all day, but I think that's the most important thing is that we're, we're talking about separating the pipe that brings data to your system from the content that's in it. And and I think that's an important thing to separate so that you don't have those things changed and tailored based on who you've gotten your access through. And it's, I think it is an important wall to keep in place. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it allows, it's what it's allowed for innovation. Um, and it's what's made the Internet what it is today. But I think it's time to... Yeah. Yeah, so how, how about if we talk about things we actually know? <laughs> well, yeah, but you just appointed me an expert after I told you clearly that I was not one. So yeah, um, yeah, you, you, you get what you Sorry. pay for. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so let's talk about MailChimp a little bit. Sure. So, 
What what is Mailchimp? I I can't imagine that anyone not list anyone listening to this show does not know what Mailchimp is. But what is Mailchimp? It's a service for sending out email newsletters. That's the simplest way to put it. Yep. And you know, it's like Getters, Monitor <laughs> and Constant yeah. Contact and others. So we we we've singled out Mailchimp. Uh, for what reason, particularly? Um, Just because? Well, because actually, for a, one big reason, um, they dumped a bunch of money into helping develop Drupal modules. Yep. So for that reason, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Campaign Monitor. I think that's an awesome service. It's just not as easy to integrate all of this stuff with Campaign Monitor, whereas Mailchimp has actually helped develop that amount modules that will allow you to not only get people to sign up for your mailing list, uh, control their subscriptions to different mailing lists that you might have, um, but also create campaigns that originate with content from your Drupal website and send them out all without even needing to go over to the MailChimp interface. You can, but you don't have to. So let's let's frame this first by, let's say someone doesn't know anything about Drupal and they're going to MailChimp. MailChimp is a tool where you can create lists of people that you want to send emails to. Yep. They can subscribe to them, and you can create templates for your newsletters. So if you have a monthly newsletter, weekly newsletter, you can go into MailChimp, type in the content that you want to have produced in this newsletter for next week, and send it to the list of people that have subscribed to your newsletter. Right, and they have a whole host of nicely designed and themed templates, or you can create uh, one of your own from there. They've got a great drag-and-drop interface to pull elements of content into a basic layout, um, images, text, what have you, and then you can customize the design. Um, it has placeholders, so you can build a template that has, uh, let's say, a large image up top, and then a logo, and then some text, and then two columns of images and text, and then go back to some other. So you can kind of customize it really easily and create that as your template and then go create a campaign, send it to a list using a particular template, which you can then customize with the content that you want to go out this month. So Jason, one of the key things you're saying is that you can, you said you can do this, you can do that, you can do this other thing, but it's who is the you in the scenario. It really right, it's, is, it's an end user, it's a customer. Right. Yep. You don't need and, any real technical expertise, right? Right, and actually that is one of the things that I think does separate MailChimp from the other services more is their focus is very much on the end user. Campaign Monitor is great, but I think their focus historically has been a little bit more on people like us, designers and developers, setting something up for our client to use. So, so the, the, the marriage here that's really interesting is that we can, have, we can interface with a tool that our end users can manipulate and work with and also bring it into the Drupal environment and right. interface with it. Right. And and so there's, like MailChimp allows you to create sort of broadly two different kinds of campaigns. One is a campaign, you know, and, and campaign is simply an email that you want to send out to some number of people to that list. And the campaign can either be content that you are creating, in our case, perhaps in Drupal, um, for many people, it would just be doing it in the MailChimp interface where you're uploading photos and adding text. Or it can be an RSS-driven campaign, which I think is a really fascinating idea where you set it to pull content in from an RSS feed and send on some periodic basis, and it will only send when there's new content in that feed. So there actually are a couple different ways that you can integrate content from Drupal into MailChimp. I've had less luck with the RSS driven one out of Drupal because you don't have as much control over the sending frequency. Um, I'd prefer to be more intentional about I've created this draft campaign now I want it to get sent out at this time. I'm curious if John or Nick are using MailChimp with any of their customers. Uh, I do with a couple of customers though it's pretty low volume. Um, I mean, they might send quarterly newsletters to less than 5,000 people. It, it's really low volume. I, I don't know if you can even argue that's being used. 
Well, I, less less than five thousand. If it's a hundred, that's low. But if it's five thousand, yeah, I wouldn't say that was low at all. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but the ones that have more, again, it's at least quarterly. I mean, it's it's not very often. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I do I have had a number of clients that, um, about three years ago that I started with Mailchimp and very quickly switched to Constant Contact. Um, and their main complaint was the support, um, the customer support, which I thought was interesting because I've always found Mailchimp to be pretty helpful. Um, but I think Constant Contact has phone support, um, where I don't know if Mailchimp does. Or at least they didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, and trying to convince clients to go back to Mailchimp once they already decided to go away is is difficult. But it's it's always sure. the first, you know, it's always the first choice when I'm setting up a newsletter for somebody. Yeah, so typically it's not it's not our job to advocate a particular product unless we think it's awesome. We, we usually try to guide products to or products to our customers uh, that fit them well in things we can integrate with. So um, I, I'm not I'm not clear on what the constant contact integration with Drupal is in that's really not a topic for today. But John, do you have any uh, MailChimp uh, experience here? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've integrated uh, MailChimp with quite a few um, quite a few clients. Um, currently, we don't have uh, anybody that I can think of off the top of my head using MailChimp uh, regularly. Um, we were looking at Mandrill, which we'll talk about later on um, for one of our uh, latest projects. Uh, but my, my question is for, for everybody. Um, I got a question here. Uh, basically, you know, sometimes it's a hard sell to sell people on Mailchimp. Um, you know, Nick just talked about um, clients using Mailchimp and then not having a problem and switching to Constant Contact. Um, when you have a client that is using Constant Contact and you know you want to switch them to Mailchimp, like two questions here: What's that sales process? You know, or how do you how do you convince them that it's it's a the, a good move? And and the second question really is like, I've heard from from sales staff and from from people that like I can't sell something called Mailchimp to you know a Fortune 500 company that that deals with you know certain in certain industries. Right. So I'm not really going to get into specifics there. So let's be clear about something here. I mean, our job is not to sell Mailchimp. I mean. And that's not even what this podcast is about, is selling MailChimp to people. I think it's an example of a way we've integrated with, with email. And I cannot uh, come up with a scenario that I've tried to sell or move someone from some other tool to MailChimp. So, let's, so let me, maybe, well, maybe someone else has some input here, but I, I'm not interested well, necessarily. Let me reword in that a little bit first. Then maybe "sell" is the wrong word, but um, yeah. you know, my migrate or or convince to use when you know yeah, it's no, I, better. I, John, we understand what you meant by "sell." You mean move them from product A to product B because you like it better. We get that, right? That's what you're asking. Not so much I like it better, but it's a better solution. Well. So we've had one or two circumstances come up like Talk that. about it. Um, and, and really what it comes down to is it's, it's not so much selling people on one service over the other. It's just if they would like to have a solution that reduces the number of steps to creating content on the website and be able to send it out to people via an email newsletter, here is a way that we can help you do that. And, and you can use this service and we can provide this or you can stick with some other service and we may not be able to help you and you know that's really what it what it has come down to for us and generally speaking I mean I I'm I'm interested to hear more from Nick over over time about the the support issues because generally speaking anytime we've introduced somebody to Mailchimp they feel it's so much easier to use than constant contact and and actually, from a developer standpoint, it's far costlier for us to do a custom template, a really custom template for a constant contact person. We don't have access to do that. Where with Campaign Monitor and Mailchimp, we want to create a custom template. We can do that really easily. 
and their right. templating language is really simple. Yeah. So, Sorry, Jason. I think I think you're you're spot on there. I think probably, and Nick can verify this. Uh, you know, I think the problem that his clients may have been having, and, and maybe Mailchimp has has fixed this, um, is that for a long time there, Mailchimp was very much like kind of like here's our support forum, here are our support documents. You know, read this and right. and and figure it out. Whereas, you know, constant contact is very much like pick up the phone, okay, I will walk you through how to do right. this so you don't have to read anything and learn anything. You can yeah. just, you know, click the buttons. MailChimp has kind of... I think that's kind of what, what what some people are just looking for. Yeah, yeah, and, and for some people, that that is exactly the most important thing. It doesn't matter if the interface is really good or really bad. As long as there's somebody there to help them use it, that's all they care about, and that's entirely yeah. valid. For us, and, that, and that could be you. That could be you as well as it is the yeah. company. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, when we were yeah. at Schoolyard, the decision that we made um, was to actually not go with any of these services because they all required some level of cost on the part of the school. We used the Simple News module instead, and so we used that to generate and send emails to, for those schools. Right. But that brings with it a whole host of other issues about how you're sending mail. Now, part of that could be solved by Mandrill, and actually, that's that would make a big difference. Um, and then you are, you know, but but Simple News has its own challenges. I mean, because you 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 know, it all of these modules are, have have their strengths and weaknesses. It's really all about how you go about creating the email that you want to send, and that's the thing that we've spent the most time on lately. So, oh, so I've I've got a question about that. Um, are so are you? You are integrating with Mailchimp. Are your clients building the email in Mailchimp, or are they building it on the Drupal site? Well, okay. So let, let me um, let me give you a little snapshot of, of what we've we've put together. We've done this for a couple of schools recently, and and it's it's working out really well. I finally kind of worked my way through all the different steps. Um, had to write a patch for the Mailchimp module to address something, but but that's at least up there, and I've got a link to that in the show notes. So when you think of a newsletter, um, it's generally speaking more than a text area and maybe an image. You know, usually you would have a number of stories. You might want to have a table of contents that shows you all the things that you're covering in this particular issue. Um, you might want to include stuff from your upcoming events. So what we, excuse me, what we did was create a newsletter issue content type and we allowed a number of other kinds of content to be attached via an entity reference to that issue. So they create the issue and then they could go and, and add content to the website and say I want this one in this issue, I want this one in this issue, I want this one. So they've accumulated in some cases they're just a separate content type called a newsletter article or other types of content throughout the website. And um, and then when they add those pieces of content, they associate it with an issue of the newsletter, and then when they edit the newsletter, they can see a window of events from the calendar, and they can check off the ones they want to include. And in that content type, we have a number of view fields, and those view fields are arranged so that we are pulling in these related pieces of content with a custom display mode so that it's showing um, just the the teasers and the photos and headlines. So when you view it as a web page, it looks like a newsletter. Um, so it's it's content that's on the site, and then it lists the upcoming events that they want to highlight, and it has everything all kind of formatted. And we're using Display Suite to create field groupings in a, a one-column layout but we're using two groupings there that we can then apply CSS to style it so that it's in two columns. And that also means we have it in a display mode that we can grab all of that content and dump it into a MailChimp capable field in a template that we've created on the MailChimp website. So it's the, the, the goal was to have content that lives on the client's website so that it's it's natively there, it's archived, it's stored, it's accessible and searchable and everything else, but they can then grab a view of that content and put it in a, a MailChimp campaign and send that out to their list. And so the the MailChimp module allows us to tie into these things. So 
the gotcha for me in using the MailChimp campaign submodule was that you can't actually use MailChimp's drag and drop templates. It doesn't work. You have to create a static HTML template. And so the trick was to create the the template through drag and drop so I could configure it easily using MailChimp's tools and then export it and import it again as its own HTML page and then it became a template that was accessible to the module. Okay. So, so Jason, oh, you're, you're what you're saying uh, just to clear it up in my own head here and maybe maybe for the listeners is basically you're using a MailChimp as a, as a theming engine for your for your um, for email. Theming and delivery. And delivery, yeah. sure, right. And you're using basically Drupal as a content population device to, to populate that email with the appropriate content before sending. Right. So the goal, you know, ultimately the goal was to have content that lives on their Drupal website that isn't isolated in some email service archive. We wanted it to be real content that lived in the site. And so we used the MailChimp module to be able to create a campaign by picking from a MailChimp list and then um, create a campaign using a template and it has to be, like I said, an HTML template that you've imported and that then will show you a form where you can insert node content from Drupal. And that's where that magic thing is, where we have this, this content type that we created, this newsletter issue, that is in itself assembled content with these view fields. And it is a, as a rendered entity dropped into that field with a token. And then when you save that draft and go over and look at it in MailChimp, it's, a, it's all of that rendered content. So we get the two columns, the automatically created table of contents, all of that stuff. The CSS just needs to live in that template. Because in, in email, you don't want to have it as a, a separate entity. Um, but we've um, we used Mailchimp's drag and drop because they had uh, as a starting point because they have lots of responsive templates and they work really well, and so we have a responsive template that we've created and we've even integrated self-hosted web fonts in there and those display in about half to three quarters of the viewers so that, that they get a really nice experience that looks very close to the um, to the website in terms of its brand identity and. Um, and it's very easy for them to create. They're just doing basic Drupal content creation and then going into the campaign creation and dropping that token in that's created for them by the module. Okay. So so they're not interacting with MailChimp at all. It's all done. Once you've set it up, it's all done in Drupal. The only thing that they have to go over to MailChimp to, to is to actually send the campaign, I think. I haven't tried sending it from... Um, from like actually sending the campaign from Drupal, I'm not actually sure if you can. Um, but generally speaking, you would want to go over to Mailchimp to preview it. You could send yourself a test version of the email, make sure everything looks good, um, because it's now content that has been rendered and stored over with um, with Mail in Mailchimp as a campaign. It's not dependent upon Drupal anymore at that point. Um, so if content changes it's disconnected at this point. So that's, that's good or bad, depending on what you need. You can tweak it if you need to, and then either send it immediately or schedule it to be sent going out to that list, and MailChimp takes care of the rest. So, Jason, just uh, something you, you touched on there. If you were to see a uh, typo in your email, would you edit it in Drupal and then resave it, and it would create a new new campaign for you to send out, or are you looking at now going to just Mailchimp and editing it directly? In, in um, I you know I think it's up to you at that point. If it's one typo, you might just decide to go fix it in Drupal and then go back to Mailchimp and just correct it there. But it's either works, other. right? Yeah, either one works. Right. You just have to know that it's disconnected. So if you fix it in Drupal, it's not necessarily going to fix it over in um, in Mailchimp. Until when? Um, so if you well, fix it in Drupal, how does it get over to Mailchimp? Um, if you fix it in Drupal, you'd either have to create a new campaign and and generate the content again, or simply go over to Mailchimp and edit it there. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so, so, on, the Drupal, the whole so on the Drupal side, it means creating something new in Mailchimp. Yeah. Once it's pushed over once to Mailchimp, you need to edit it on Mailchimp. Right. Okay. So you know we've we've done this. Um, it's been in use for 
um, a month, month and a half now with one school. It's just going into use um, with this other project, and um, and so far, you know, while it's been a little bit of a journey to kind of work out these kinks, um, it, it actually is is working really nicely. And the only two real gotchas were one is is you have to save out your template in Mailchimp as an HTML one and import it again so it shows up in the list. And the other one is the patch that I put in the show notes to avoid contextual links being rendered for some view content um, when it's displayed in the Mailchimp template. And so, the, the template export and re-import is only done once. Right. Per yep. template. Right. That you're using you know, generally, you know, so generally speaking, you, you do all your work in Mailchimp to test that template in all the different browsers and mail clients and everything else, and then you don't have to touch it. You know, because it's kind of done at that point, and and that way, um, you can then continue to test it in the future. Should you like change the content structure? Right. But basically, what you're doing is grabbing one big div of content that has all of the other bits in it. And in our case, um, it's stuff that is separated into two columns, um, so that we can actually make it reflow pretty nicely in a mail client that does res that support media queries so that it can reflow into a single column. Um, and the one, that, the one that I sent out yesterday for the people that had signed up to get um, notifications for my book and workshops um, was my first experiment with um, using web fonts and something that got delivered and, and the response has been fantastic. And it really looks good. Um, so Jason, just out of curiosity, um, once you do the uh, export and re-import of the template, say for whatever reason I wanted to send um, an email directly from Mailchimp using using that template, mm -hmm. that's still a possibility, oh, right? Yeah. There, oh yeah, no... it's it's not it's not specific to Drupal at all. It's just you. The only thing is you if you need to make changes to that template, you're editing the HTML page. You can't use the drag and drop editor at that point. Right. Which is okay. not really that big. That's why you you know do your work ahead of time to, um, to use the drag and drop to to customize things. Um, but then you know once it's HTML, you can pull it out and work on it in Coda. You can do whatever you want, and 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 mess around with it, um, and then save it out back in um, in Mailchimp. It's it's a really easy to use interface. So I, I stepped away for a minute or two here, and I just want to ask a question. If you've covered it already, say so. You can just tell me. But how how do you deal with the text emails? Because in the Mailchimp interface, you can you can view the HTML emails, and then you can go in to say, hey, what does the text version of this look like? Um, my assumption is that's all handled on the Mailchimp side. It it is, and to be honest, we haven't spent a lot of time looking at that. We've let it let Mailchimp sort of automatically generate it. Okay. So it's probably terrible, but. Um, but serviceable, because everything's in div. So if it's breaking down by source order, it's actually okay. Like we're actually all right with it coming in that format. So I think I think it would be advisable for someone to look, go and look in the Mailchimp side. Absolutely. Click on the what the what is the text version of this look like just to yeah. check it out. Well, and and so and that's where you would want to make use of all of Mailchimp's tools to exactly. test it, run an inbox test on it. Um, if you have one of the paid subscriptions. So that's actually something worth mentioning. Um, I'll get, I'll come back to that in a second. But if you're using one of the paid versions, then you also have access to a lot more testing tools to see what your email will look like in a ton of different email clients. Mm -hmm. um, so Mailchimp has a way. They their um, pricing is such that you can use um, their free account is up to two thousand list members and up to 12,000 emails per month, and that will never cost you anything. The only requirement is that you have this little MailChimp graphic in the footer of the message. So for small organizations, it's great. Like, that's what we're using. So, I mean, H&W does not have that big a list. You know, you talk about a list size of less than 100. That's me. So, you know, that's people that signed up for um, getting not uh, notifications about the book and, and, and the workshops. But happily for me, that means 63% of the people opened it and 22% clicked on it. And I just sent that a day ago. So, you know, that's good. That's great. And it looks look nice. Um, but for larger organizations, you need to look at what the, the paid subscriptions are. 
um, and you get a few more tools for testing. So you can do mailbox spam tests, you can do formatting tests, you can check out the HTML version of it and customize that to your heart's content, and then you can go ahead and hit send or schedule. Okay, so let's move on to... Anything else anyone wants to say about MailChimp before we move on to Mandrel? And what that Actually, means? I do I do have a quick question with yeah. the module to see if they fix something that I remember it being a struggle <laughs> a while back. Because, had, because, because we have the maintainer of the module on the podcast. Yeah, no, no, no. I, but <laughs> some of it, let's use it. So as with any newsletter company, you can have multiple lists. But the last time I was implementing MailChimp, it required a separate block for each list. There was no way for me to just have one block and allow somebody to check off boxes to choose which list they were on. Um, I took a fair I, amount of... No, I believe that's all in a single block. Yeah. I mean, okay, there actually so have been... There have been updates fairly regularly to the module okay. now. It's up to 7.3.2. Uh, that was updated on November 7th, so just three days. Oh, okay. Um, I could so, do a fair amount of work to get that in one block. Yeah, um, so, I mean, there's not really been any development on the 6X branch, but the 7... The 7 Three version has seen some pretty active development, uh, and and so far, you know, like we we haven't needed to do that much with list management for those clients because we just set up the initial lists for them, and that was really all they needed. Um, we've spent most of our time dealing with how content renders and integrating the campaigns. Um, so the only thing that I've had to do there was I wrote one patch um, that's uh, that I submitted that will eliminate the contextual links being rendered when you have an attached view mm -hmm. to a content type. Um, and that's been a known issue since the 6th branch. That was actually where I got the initial port uh, code to port over. Hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I have to say, like that's one of, I think, three or four patches that I ended up submitting throughout the course of working on this project. Um, it's been really kind of cool. To, it's sort of pushed me to make sure that everything that we're doing is going back to Drupal.org, so I've been pretty excited about how that's turned out. So let's, let's talk about Mandrel a little bit. So Mandrel is a companion service from MailChimp, which is really a... How do I describe this? It's a, a way if you send out emails, SMTP emails, through a service for bulk emails. And... And is, that, to, is that a good description of that? Yeah, and, and to underscore yeah. why you need it, when you yeah. send out large volumes of email, that flags your web server, if it's originating from Drupal, mm -hmm. as a volume mail sender, and if it doesn't all look legit, you can very quickly get blacklisted, right. and or you can just suffer from huge performance issues when you're trying to render all of these HTML emails and send them out to thousands of people. So in this case, what it will allow you to do is basically send out that message, like render that message, and then have somebody else handle all of the sending of it. Actually, yeah, I think it helps with that. I'm not sure how much it helps with the performance, because as I understand it, it still needs to connect. Doesn't it connect with Mandrill? Well, but you're, you're, you're you not need, dealing email. with the SMTP process, oh, which yeah. is a very yeah, yeah, yeah. intensive one. Yeah, that's true. That's a yes. lot of handshakes between servers. Yeah, you can yep. essentially, you, depending on how you have it set up, um, you can have it handle all of your um, your system emails as well as all of your newsletter emails. And at that point, you could really just shut off, shut off the SMTP process on your server um, because Mandrill is going to take care of all that for you, um, which can, can help with the performance, definitely. Well, it's also a security plus, too. Yeah, and it's it's got similar pricing to Mailchimp as far as volume goes. I think the first twelve thousand are generally free, free. per month, and then um, and then it get, it it goes up from there. I think it's something like twenty cents per thousand, up to a million after that, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it can very quickly add up. <laughs> um, one one thing. Yeah. One thing I did want to note, uh, Steve had mentioned it's a companion to to Mailchimp. I would I would say you know it is a, it is a separate service for anybody out there that might have yeah. well because you can use one without the other 
You can, yeah. you can use it independently of MailChimp, um, but you can use MailChimp templates within Mandro. So. Yeah, that, that's why I call it a companion. Yeah, so you can, you can configure Mandro to use a particular template that you've created in MailChimp. That's cool. I hadn't really dug into that at all. And, you know, one thing that we didn't mention at all about MailChimp, but it's true for both of these, is one of the big reasons to use something like this rather than sending everything yourself is analytics. I mean, they provide so much fantastic information on who's opening it, what they're using, what mail client it's in, um, what country it's in, open rates, click rates. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic the amount of information that you can get. It, it really is awesome. The other thing that's cool is too, um, using the you, you know using Mandrill and then the, and the um, Mailchimp templates, you have the ability to essentially send your email as completely plain text, and have Mandrill based on the subject of that email put it into put it into uh, the appropriate wrapper template and send it out. So. Again, there's another performance savings because you're not, you know, you're not doing all that chugging on putting together this mail template to send it to the service to send it out. You're having Mandrill handle all of that for you. So, I'm just curious: is uh, how many are you guys using Mandrill? I know I use it. Are you guys using it? We looked, at, we looked at it very, very heavily for a, uh, a client project that we're working on right now. Um, uh, we didn't end up using it, but it was it was very impressive, and it was very, it was at the top of our list. Like, and the reason I ask this is I'm trying to find a reason in my head as we're talking right now as to a reason not to use it. Um, like, if you're sending out emails from your website in general. What would be a reason not to create an account? Like the 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 minimum, like for free, you get twelve thousand emails a month. Really? Why would you not in, use Mandrill? In my head, the 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 baseline reason why you wouldn't use it is because you're only sending out random transactional emails, and it's not you know it's not worth the time to set it up. Well, I, the, the, the time to set it up is minimal. I mean, it's it's less than thirty minutes probably. It's also up. it's also scary for people. I think you know they, when you're when you're you know looking at like using a third party service like this. I think a lot of people look at it as like there's a learning curve there. Um, I agree. You could have Mandrill up and running within like within like an hour with a template set up and everything works. Well, well, the point is, John, is that you can set it up in Drupal that no one even knows from the Drupal side that it's going out through Mandrill. It. it Right. There's nothing required. You can set up the SMTP server to go out through Mandrill and no one knows it. Right. Yeah. No, just, you, I was just curious as to why. I think um, well, one one thing is it is it does it does impact the headers. So it does. If, yep. So if you don't configure it, it's it shows up as this message was sent, you know, from so and so, from, you know, Mandrill on behalf of. And so, like that can actually cause a little bit of weirdness for some people if you don't have everything configured the right way, and and have it set up as a legitimate mail sending domain. So that's just it's not a reason not to do it. It's just an right. additional consideration. Right. I mean, that's you know one thing that gets tricky is that web serving is often now separated from email serving. Oh, it's absolutely email. separated. And. Yeah. and so more restrictive email hosts are are getting stickier about you generating a message on your web server and saying it's coming from this customer domain dot com mm. where and making sure that's an authenticated sender or an approved sender of email for that domain. Now you're taking it a step further and saying not just the web server needs to be the legitimate sender, but also this other service has to be a legitimate sender. So right. in order to control Mail spoofing and and you know mail reputation basically um, M A I L just to be clear email reputation so you know that you want to make sure that it doesn't seem like your domain is the source of spam um, making sure you have all those things connected when you're dealing with one bunch of people who aren't necessarily the people at the client who are in charge of email hosting can sometimes be a little bit of a pain. Yep. 
different. Anyway, I just, that was just the only reason why I didn't Nick, 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 do Nick you're dying to say something. I'd say it. No, no, I was just going to talk about the the next thing. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, and as for and to Jason's point, yeah, I mean, I've dealt with some really restrictive email cli- clients that have really restrictive settings on their email, and getting the web server marked as spam within one, the very first email that went out got the server blacklisted as spam um, because it hadn't had all the settings correct. And using something, you know, setting something like that up certainly helps with it. Um, you know, using using something like Mandrill or another service is a way to help that a little bit is because they've already established themselves as an entity that is reputable and is doing the best they can to prevent spam. So it is helpful if you're sending out newsletter type things or bulk communication, it's really helpful in some of those circumstances to have a, a company like like MailChimp behind what you're trying to do. I think, you know, what it really comes down to is any website that has users logging in that's sending a lot of transition, or not even a lot, but if you have users on your website other than, you know, just admin users, and, or you're sending out a newsletter, you know, setting up Mandrill and, and, or using MailChimp is, is kind of a no-brainer. Um, back to what I was saying before, uh, when Steve asked why, why wouldn't you use Mandrill? Um, I think, you know, if, if your site is purely, you know, blog based, you're not sending out, you know, trans, uh, you know, you're not sending out newsletter emails. I do think, I do think the, the, the level of effort has to be considered. Um, but if you're sending out any sort of emails to a large quantity of people or even a smaller quantity of people, I think it's definitely worthwhile to look into it. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, so I, one thing that I found is useful is probably worth uh, mentioning. Anytime you're dealing with testing email, whether it's transactional or informational from the website, um, an indispensable module is mail redirect. <laughs> yeah. It will protect you. That's a great module. <laughs> <laughs> it will save your hide. Um, it's a very simple module. You just install it, and then the configuration really is you just basically say, instead of emailing whoever you're trying to email, email this other address instead. And you can just put your email or fake email address in order to, although a fake probably isn't very good, but you can forward all email from the website, from the dev site, to you instead of mass emailing all of your clients or customers um, accidentally when you're trying to test something. Um, oh, I, this, module, this module could be our module of the week, by the way. Uh, it's, <laughs> not, but it's a module that if you're if you should have activated on your development website, period. Well, that, it's like that and stage file proxy. Those are like the things yeah. that you should yeah. just always have. Yeah, exactly. Yep, I, I've got a few others I can add to that, but we'll just leave it. That <laughs> too, but, yeah, stage file proxy and. Uh, but, I mean, stage file proxy is an issue for the developing side. I mean, you don't see images. But yeah. this one is a communication with customers. Right. You never yeah. want to just send out, just just put in a right. test order on a website and have it go to a customer. is insane. So, yeah. Well, it, yeah, it's mostly it bundled under that. that things to make me not look like an idiot. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, 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 and the thing is, even if... Ultimately, if it's one order, you can very easily be like, "Oh yeah, that was you know that was a test." But if you if you run a cron job and send off five thousand emails to all their <laughs> customers, that's a bit more difficult to to recover from. Yeah, so, yeah this this module is a lifesaver. If you're ever in doubt of whether you should use it or not, just use it. <laughs> and if you end up with five thousand emails in your inbox, it's, fun, it's funny you say that. We, we, we totally use mail redirect um, to kind of just black hole emails to our to our domain name, but uh, not so not so long ago, last week or the week before, I got an email from a um, pretty pretty reputable source, and then five minutes later, I got another email with like correction, and then you know I don't, I don't even know what the Sorry correction about that. <laughs> I don't even know what the correction was. I didn't look at it that that you know diligently, but I was like, I was like, oh man, so you send out like 5,000 emails and then you send out another 5,000 emails, that's, 
that's that's not a good thing. I've got actually a couple of those recently. It's been, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, pretty large companies as well saying, "Oh, we didn't mean to actually announce that product yet. Please ignore it." <laughs> Although, you know, you could say, you know, it's interesting because that might be a marketing technique because it's just like with the newspaper. If there's getting getting retraction printed, sometimes is worse than just having an original mistake because you're now you're telling all the fifty thousand people, "Oh, hey, there was a mistake." <laughs> And most people probably didn't even notice. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to just change our direction here. Officially, our module of the week is mail redirect. <laughs> right? So it, it's a module that allows you to, when you install it, when you set it up, any emails coming from, from your website will go to one person that you would define in the redirect. So any outbound emails go to one place, and you cannot make a mistake by sending them to customers or anybody else. Yeah, it's a lifesaver. You Great can also, module. You can also set it to just send them to like a domain, which which acts as a black hole, doesn't send it to anybody. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's it's one single email address. Yeah. It, it yeah. could be whatever address you want it to be. And and you don't have to worry about remembering like user notifications and orders and commerce and like it just anytime Drupal tries to send a message it uses the other email or black hole instead so Nick, if how, about, how about if someone registers for the website and they get a, or a password reset it'll get sent to your exactly your account everything it goes, it goes to this redirect yeah only. it overrides the Drupal send mail yep. function so extremely helpful that will be our module of the week. Well, there it is. That was I'll update the show notes. Great, great addition. Thanks, Nick. No problem. We'll, we'll save this one, which has been on the docket for three weeks now, I think. We got pushed down. Uh, we'll save it for next week. Maybe we'll use it again. It's super secret. We can't tell you what it is, or you'd no. never tune in next week. No, I mean, no. It's a, it's a great. It's what they call a tease in the business. <laughs> um, well, casual too. Good. I, it's, it's it's well it's it's a good module. So so we've we've put the teaser out there about this amazing module that we're going to talk about, but not tell you what it is. You'll understand what it'll all add up next week. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, probably, so we, probably, we, all pro we all promised that we're going to push it out another week, right? Right. So we so so also talk too. about what we're going to talk about next week because I think we got to let people know that the much awaited recap of Nude Camp is coming next week with hopefully a couple special guests to help us talk about it. Yeah, so uh, everyone has listened to us drone on for uh, probably too many minutes over the past six months about the conference that we organized, the New England Drupal Camp, and we had a, we had a session, we had a podcast about it maybe two months ago, and we said we'd do a recap, so the recap will be next week. Uh, and you can, uh, if you're interested in holding a Drupal camp and want some information, this would be a good show to listen to. Yeah, I think that that's it's it's good for us to kind of share everything that we went through. You know, in some ways, it's um, it's not as hard as you might think, and then there's other stuff that you just don't want to don't you don't want to let trip you up. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's let's wrap, Jason. Um, what can people find you online, and what do you got coming up? Anything? Um, well, uh, you can find me at Jay Pomintel on all the social networks and at hwdesignco.com if you want to check out work. Um, if you are curious about book-related things, rwt.io to find information about the book or a workshop at webcoffee.co. Um, but tonight, I will be at Drupal PVD listening to... John Cianci and Kathy Beck from Oomph talk about owning your own base team. A uh, reprise of a talk they gave at Nude Camp, but I didn't get to see it, so I'm really excited. I want to see what, they're, what they've been up to. So um, I think we'll have a good turnout. So I'm with you, Jason. I'm looking forward to this talk tonight at Drupal PVD. I was not able to attend that particular session two weeks ago, so I'm looking forward to it. It's like a bonus for me. <laughs> so, John, 
tell us about uh, you and where you will be. I, I will also be at uh, Drupal PVD tonight, and I am also looking forward to it because I did not get to see it when they... Uh, when they presented it at Nude Camp, even though even though I, I helped a little bit in uh, putting it together, but so that's where I'll no, be. They're going to be giving it here, so we're like, okay, I'll see something else that day and 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 catch the re catch the the rebroadcast tonight. That that was that was uh, that was a good plan on your part. Um, I will also be uh, November eighteenth down in Newport, Rhode Island, speaking uh, to NIM, which is the Newport Internet Marketers. Um, about maximizing your partner consultant relationship. That looks like it's going to be a really good event. It it does look like it's going to be a good time. I was working on my slide deck last night, and uh, it is sure to uh, it is sure to please. Um, so that's where I'll be uh, next Tuesday, actually, um, down there at Newport, Rhode Island. So come on by. You can uh, find out more at NewportInteractiveMarketers.com. Uh, as always, you can find me on all the social networks at John Picozzi and always on at umfink.com. Thank you, John. How about you, Nick? You can find me online at Nick's Fan pretty much everywhere. And tonight in person in Providence, I'll also be at the meetup. Looking forward to it. I also miss the talk at New Camp. Makes it sound like we didn't go in any talks, but <laughs> I think we were all actually speaking at the same time. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, and next month I'll be joining you guys from out of the country. So oh, looking nice. forward to that. Not not going to a conference or anything, just visiting family. But I'll be I'll be in South America. You're getting there a little bit ahead of schedule for the DrupalCon going on there in a few months. Yeah, I, I was I was really planning on going, but it's difficult to justify flying back two and a half weeks after we get back to America. So I think uh, LA will be the first kind I go to. Great. So uh, you can find me online at Stephen Cross on Twitter. Also, Nick and I will be doing a webinar next Tuesday on the 18th. I think the date is. Uh, it's just a recap of or, or a, a reprise of the webinar of the session we did at Nude Camp regarding Drupal 8. So you can check that out at parallaxinfotech.com. Sign up there uh, to join the webinar. And I'm really looking forward to see you guys tonight. Yeah. And, you know, Steve, you, um, do you want to mention the, the little Drupal 8 Club? Yeah, that, of course I should. That was, that was really good. I mean, it was, a, it was a great group of people on, you know, two sides of one continent and, a, and, and coming from another one. Um, and I think we all learned a lot about Drupal 8. It was uh, it was great. So that was that was yesterday. Yeah. So on every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, we're having a I call it like a book club format, but it's really just a bunch of people getting together to talk about a topic on Drupal 8. If you go to exploringdrupal8.com, this will take you to a page that will give you some information about what this is and it's really you know any number of people getting together and talking about a particular topic that website will take you to a page on talking Drupal which outlines what the topic is for the following week uh, if you're interested in joining you could just send me email so I can add you to the invite list you could email me at Stephen with a ph at parallaxmail.com or look at that website which I mentioned was exploring Drupal 8.com and we'll add you to the invite list. Anybody is welcome. And it really was a fantastic hour of, there was probably yeah. 12 or 15 people on the call. Yeah, and we, 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 had like a, we talked about a, a Drupal 8 topic. It was very interesting. Yeah, and I mean, I, you know, we, we just put up a, a really, really simple documentation site in Drupal 8, uh, but learned a ton in the process and learned a whole bunch more um, going through the authoring experience with the group yesterday. So lots of lots of good stuff going on there. Yeah, so feel free to join and um, get into the conversation, which is really all that is. All right, guys. I think this is a wrap. All right. See you tonight. All right, take care, See everyone. See you tonight. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.